We have to prepare and assume we will have a direct hit by this catastrophic hurricane. The storm is coming. The hurricane, the big hurricane. We've been tracking Hurricane Matthew since its beginning, since it came off the coast of Africa. We are preparing for the worst. We are hoping for the best. Some of us are wondering, do we go where? Do we stay here? Your questions answered. It has some ingredients that could make it catastrophic, and we're not being overly dramatic about that. I'm standing in a four-way stop here on First Street in Jacksonville Beach. The water that you see here is coming in from the ocean. As you can see, the wind is blowing pretty hard. The house behind me is pretty hard to see, but the house behind me, their driveway, the water is up to the car in their driveway. You can see just how deep it is. After this, we are going to move to higher ground and get shelter. And if you look out further, I want you to see the bay is overflowing here. Look at the palm trees. The wind is so powerful. The marina right behind us, the boats are rocking back and forth. Just the flooding is incredible. It is like nothing I have ever seen here. Take a look at this. You can see where the water has breached the dunes and on a strong wave as it approaches, it will almost create a funnel all the way down. Watch this come up. It'll just create a wave all the way down that goes towards First Street South here. It's just the flooding is immense. When you take a look, you see some people still trying to drive in this, which is just so hazardous because this water is deep out here and it could definitely move a vehicle because it is moving swiftly from the ocean towards Third Street A1A. Even for those of you not concerned about the storm surge, that's another two hours of these battering winds and trees in your area and another two hours where that rain has no place to go because the water is so high and so the flooding is going to get worse before it gets better. There's more beach here than there has been in hours and that's good news because people were worried about the storm surge. Just hours ago it was going all the way up to the gate there and people were worried that the storm surge may actually go into the city but it's held off and that's good news for Fernandina Beach. Hola mis amigos, estoy aquí en First Coast News hablando en español a ayudarte si no puedes hablar inglés. As the water comes crashing, breaching the dunes, and I mean just flooding First Street. I'm guessing water is inside that restaurant right there. And a tree has fallen over because the ground is so saturated here. The Morning Glory Church steeple has completely toppled over. We've never been through this before. We've never done this before. I've seen the devastation that a hurricane can leave behind. I've been there with people when they've lost everything. It's my job to be there when people are going through a crisis. It's my job to show what we experienced, what our community went through. So, the storm is gone, or maybe it's not. In fact, in many ways, I think, uh, I think this is the toughest part of the storm. That is, that is the mess um, that is left. And uh, for some folks, it's, um, it's the mess of their, the lives of their homes. Hurricane Matthew has passed, and now it is time to rebuild. But tonight, it's challenging. Maybe you're like thousands of folks here on our first coast. Your power's off, you want it back on, and you want it back on soon. Good evening, and thank you for being with us. I'm Heather Crawford. And I'm Anthony Austin. Many of you, I know, spent the day taking a look at the damage to your home after wondering when would you be able to return. An estimated $2 billion of damage left behind by Hurricane Matthew in just St. John's County alone. Now, a part of the Jacksonville Beach Pier is gone tonight. Hundreds in St. Augustine are faced with flooded homes. Docks are submerged underwater in Flagler County. We continue to be first for you as our community continues to pick up the pieces. And we have team coverage for you tonight. We begin with Brittany Dion, who's taking a look at the damage in St. Augustine. Just kind of tell me what sort of damage, what was the first thing you saw when you came in? Obviously, there's no light, so I'll let you go first then, Jeff. You mean hold that? The ceiling was the first thing. Oh my goodness. Okay, just be careful. So what is it? Is this your living room? What was living left room, of it? Bedroom. Oh my goodness. It's not real safe to do too much. Though. No, no, I can imagine. So walking into your house, when did you first come home? Yesterday, when I got the phone call. Yesterday what? afternoon when they let us in because they wouldn't let traffic in for a while. Well, guys, we just spoke to the family that owns this house. They just got home. They'd evacuated. They came here to see their house and all of this damage for the very first time. What I do know is they've lived here for 10 years. The people who live here is a family. They have three young children. Owners Jerry and Joan Galasso closed the restaurant Wednesday, knowing the danger was near, but never thinking this is what they'd find. All booths on, on this wall. Their restaurant 
a mangled mess. Hurricane Matthew tossed tables, walloped windows. This cabinet was anchored to this wall here. And weighing thousands of pounds. Their 2,000 pound walk-in fridge holding $10,000 worth of seafood was flung across the parking lot like a Frisbee. Well, the only thing that got broken. With this damage, the Colossos don't think they'll reopen. Shelby, you're on my street. Shelby, you're on my street. Okay. Yes, I'm turning the camera. I'm going to try okay. to turn it here. Okay. We're getting close. Okay. So, uh, okay. Jess, you're oh, about to see her home. Right. Say, Jess, it looks good. It looks good. <laughs> How's the roof? How's the roof? <laughs> it looks like it's inside. Okay. okay. This month, Jackson Buell turns two. He's a little boy whose very life defies expectations. His own doctor calls him a miracle. Jackson was born with an extreme brain malformation, and when we first met him a year ago, his family was amazed at his progress, but unsure of what life would be like for him today with this very rare condition. Well, now Jackson is surprising even those who believed in him the most with all that he can do. And he is a huge Jaguars fan, so we enlisted the help of Jags great Fred Taylor to help us share Jackson's inspiring story. My name is Jackson Buell. And there are a lot of pictures of me. People took so many, they didn't think they had much time. Unfortunately, there's no cure for uh, microhydroencephaly. It means my brain is about a fifth of the size it should be. In fact, they told us to simply take him home because they expected him to pass away. But we saw a strength right away. Those are my parents, Brandon and Brittany. Good job. They didn't have a lot to go off of when I was born. Are you the cutest baby ever? First month of his life, they had him hooked up to every single machine in cord, in line, and whatever you could think of because they thought he was going to need all these things. But had big faith. We believed for a while that and what the doctors told us would happen. And we were just ready to try and be prepared to lose our son. Now we just believe the sky's the limit for him. But look at the pictures of me. I got older, not just months, but years. Can you smile for mommy? Can you smile for mommy? No way. And I grew Seriously? from four pounds to 12. Oh, I love you too. I love you. I do. Yes, I see you. Blonde curly hair got so long, I had to have a haircut earlier this year. He shocks us every day. I sleep by myself in my own bedroom. Give mommy a kiss. Keep pushing. Here we go. Oh, good job. Here we go. And step by step, Give mama a kiss. Really I'm well, figuring buddy. out how to get around the house. Keep pushing. Oh, oh my goodness. Oh, Initially, we thought that he was just going to be brainstem functions, which are just mostly control of respiration and heart rate and those types of things. That's my doctor, Carl Barr. Oh, you looking at mommy? Where are you going? If you look at literature that's available, oh, you yeah. would say that it would be unlikely that he would survive to his first birthday. Certainly second birthday would Hi, be baby. Um, unusual. Oh, you love your rattle, don't you? Literally every day there's something new that he does and we are floored. And it's just so fun and exciting, the little milestones that he's meeting and talking and mommies and Addies <laughs> and hey, those are like his three favorite words. Hi, Jack. <laughs> I'm learning new things too. Jackson, you eating a cookie? How to eat by myself without a feeding tube. So yummy. And how to swim. Yeah, are you having fun in the pool? People ask us all the time, well, what's Jackson's prognosis? There is no prognosis one. anymore because he's already by far exceeded expectations doctors gave him. Mm. 
I'm almost to my second birthday. No doubt, there will be pictures of that. My parents will share them here. Baby, you having fun? Where I've got almost 400,000 friends. We started you know, petrified, we were scared, we were clueless and didn't know what to do, where to turn. We don't want the next family to have to start off that way. If they receive a diagnosis that's similar, we hope that they think of Jackson's story, know about it, they reach out to us, or they find the resources quicker. I love you. I love you. <laughs> and we just want one more day, one more day, for him to just wake up that day, be excited, be happy, and that, one more, and that one more person learns about Jackson's story and can take something from his story. My story is still going. His book's not written yet. And each day that passes is like me, another small miracle. Parents of kids in sports know the sales pitch. A high profile coach promises college scholarships to your budding superstar. All they have to do is trust the coach. But who's protecting the trusting kids once the parents are sold? We poured over hundreds of pages of transcripts from a hearing involving a USA volleyball coach in 1995. Three of his former players allege that he sexually abused them. Tonight, you will hear from them. You gotta play D and hit so you don't have a wing. Volleyball is a game of boundaries. Sit, good control. On the court, the lines are clear. Save it, save it. Anything outside them is off limits. Hey, Joy, remember, you're an off hitter, you're up for tips. It's a game that Sarah Powers Barnhart masters. There you go, way to be smart, good. Teen star turned pro turned coach. Hey, fight your platform. She started playing club volleyball at Sports Performance Volleyball outside of Chicago when she was 15. BP, you're an animal. Nice digs. It was like a cult, really. Her coach, Rick Butler, promised to take her to the next level. He ran one of the most successful junior volleyball programs in the country and was her surest path to a college scholarship. Rick made it really clear that if you played for anybody else, you probably weren't going to get that scholarship, that this was the only place you were going to get it. So you were well aware that you were, you were tied in and, and you needed to commit to whatever that meant. What that meant for Sarah was something completely out of bounds. Practice covering your hitter. In a lawsuit filed in 2016 against the AAU, Sarah alleges Butler sexually abused her while he was her coach and she was his star player. From the time she was 16 until she was 18, she says in her complaint, Butler sexually molested her. It was a pretty rough time for me. The first time she says he crossed the line was on an out-of-town volleyball trip. And he s explained to me that I needed to follow him blindly, and it means that I had to follow whatever he said whenever he said it. And at that point, he leaned over and kissed me. That was just the beginning. Sarah says she lost her virginity to a coach she trusted. And uh, the sexual abuse started that summer. How many times did Rick Butler sexually abuse you? More than I can count. Yeah, hundreds. You're playing to not make an error. You didn't hit that ball like I know you can. In 1995, Sarah told USA Volleyball's Ethics and Eligibility Committee that Butler sexually abused her. That committee found the allegations credible. In this letter to her attorney, the chair of the committee wrote, quote, there is no question he is a talented and charismatic coach. Nonetheless, the psychological harm caused by his having entered into sexual relationships with children entrusted to his care far outweighs these accomplishments and necessitates the imposition of grave sanctions, end quote. In that committee hearing, Butler told USA Volleyball that he had a consensual sexual relationship with Sarah. He also said he had consensual sexual relationships with two others. Butler told the committee that the relationships with all three women began after they turned 18 and were no longer on his team. USA Volleyball banned Butler for life. Now, passers work on getting this good pass. Five years later, it reversed that decision. Butler was allowed back if he promised he would not coach junior girls. Appalled. We never realized lifetime ban meant five years. In a statement to First Coast News, the chair of the USA Volleyball Board of Directors, Lori Okamura, called the decision to reinstate Butler, quote, a mistake. 
and says he is still banned from coaching junior girls in any activity requiring USA Volleyball membership. Butler has never faced any criminal charges. The statute of limitations had expired by the time his alleged victims came forward. He denies ever sexually abusing anyone. Butler's attorney says the allegations are absolutely false and in a statement says, quote, Rick Butler has never been accused of committing any crime, nor could he be based upon the complete fabrication invented by these women. First Coast News spoke with the two other women Butler told USA Volleyball he had had consensual relationships with. Those women alleged the relationships began when they were minors and that the sex was not consensual. Why would we come forward if it didn't happen? You know, I, I'm not asking for money. I'm not asking for anything. The, all, the whole reason why I came forward was to help prevent it from happening to other girls. 49 years old and there are still times, um, let me get it together here. <clears throat> it affects me every day. It affects me every day. Butler continues to coach. Save it. Which means that he and Sarah occasionally cross paths at tournaments. Heard his voice and I looked up and he was sitting close to my table and the reaction to me was I felt sick to my stomach. Sarah worries she will again come face to face with Butler at the AAU Girls Junior National Volleyball Championships in Orlando next month. She sued the AAU last year to try to force the group to expel Butler. Last week that suit was dismissed without prejudice meaning that it can be refiled within 20 days. The lawsuit is created to forced the AAU to ban him from coaching. He was banned 20 years ago from USA Volleyball and he's still coaching. It's a travesty. Butler's attorney says the ban was unfair because USA Volleyball quote prevented Rick Butler from defending himself by not allowing him to present witnesses in his own defense. Butler's attorney says he's a member in good standing with both USA Volleyball and the AAU and has coached over 20,000 junior females over the past 16 years without a single complaint. Let's keep score here. But Sarah Sorry. says the fact he's still on the court shows the AAU is more concerned with making money than protecting young girls. It's one of the top junior volleyball coaches in the nation and brings a lot of money in. I'm really clear that money is creating a situation where they won't take him out. And that's sad because they're saying money's more important than the safety of these young players. She says she's speaking out and will continue to do so for one reason. No one was there for me. If I am doing anything that keeps somebody away from a little girl or gives a voice to a little girl, then it means something to me and I'll keep doing it. Well, how much would you pay for a can of baby formula? Most parents pay an average of $22 a can, but can you imagine paying $400? That is a lot of money, and that's what TRICARE Insurance for Military Families has been paying companies for just one can of their hypoallergenic formula, even though the sticker price is, well, just around $40. And what's more, your federal tax dollars may be footing the bill. Our On Your Sides, Julia Janae has been investigating this overspending for the past six months. She joins us now with why the government is allowing this to happen. Corn or veggies? Lily Witherspoon's son Aaron is one in a million unique. You have to be very accurate because too much could cause a lot of problems and too little could cause many problems too. He has a rare digestive condition that makes what he eats a daily struggle. We were just strictly breastfeeding, so um, they stopped me from that because the condition that he has actually causes him to not be able to break down fat. So they put him on the formula. Her son is one of thousands of children in the U.S. who are prescribed a hypoallergenic formula for an array of medical issues. The cost is typically double that of regular formula. But that's nowhere near the prices discovered by a military mother on Jacksonville Southside. She wanted to remain anonymous to protect her job, but she told us what she found in her military health insurance paperwork left her dumbfounded. She noticed a $6,400 price tag for 15 cans of formula. That's over $420 for each 14 ounce can. And that's what her TRICARE insurance paid to company Bioscript that manufactures a formula called Neocate. But on Neocate's website, anyone else can purchase the same can of formula for $46. 
and that can paid by taxpayers nearly 10 times more expensive than the cost to the general public. It's very easy to cave into the system. Harvey Matorin is president of Claim Security of America in Jacksonville, a company that helps patients manage their medical bills and insurance paperwork. He confirms this price isn't a typo. A lot of these charges are based on what's called usual and reasonable and customary charges. And sometimes they're within those ranges and sometimes they're significantly out of those ranges. We've been asking everyone involved how these charges are possible. We first talked to the TRICARE representative for the Department of Defense. They tell us that there's no set Medicare rate for this type of formula and that they go by a state prevailing rate, which is based on claims data. Now, Bioscript, the company that makes the formula, says all Medicare manufacturers bill this way by the calorie and not the can and that can has 1600 calories in it meaning at 27 cents per calorie at the state prevailing rate that's how this can becomes a $400 purchase with taxpayer money new tonight a first coast news investigation into overpriced baby formula is getting results our story exposed the company billing more than $400 for a single can of baby formula. Well, thousands of you all across the country reacted to this story online, calling it a waste of taxpayer money. On your side, Julia Janae has been investigating this case for seven months now and hasn't stopped asking questions. Now she has learned that the company has been ordered to give the government a big refund and the local military family who first reached out to us is also getting thousands of dollars back. After our initial story aired, the Department of Defense said it would be working to determine if any abuses have occurred regarding billing the government in excess of reasonable charges. Now that investigation appears to have triggered a refund. Last week, TRICARE told the patient upon review it has been determined that an overpayment was made to Bioscript. How much over? $16,000 just in this one case now due back to the government as a refund. TRICARE hasn't released the details on how this overpayment occurred or how widespread it is. And I think anyone really would be shocked by the payment rates um, that this individual was seeing. Now, Bioscript says overpayments like this happen often in healthcare, and they're going to do an internal review to determine if they are going to refund the government that money. So how is the family reacting to the news? They are very happy, especially because today they got a call from the company saying they were going to reimburse them the entire $2,000 wow. amount wow. that they paid as a copay for these rates. They say what's most important is they hope that other families aren't going to have to deal with this because of that formula that children they rely on for yeah. oftentimes survival. We are following breaking news from downtown Jacksonville, the federal court. The verdict handed down. Congresswoman Corrine Brown guilty. Her attorney vowing to fight on. So you should look out for some motions that we will be filing for a new trial. We broke the story of her indictment last summer. Tonight, from her supporters to her critics, we're on your side. This is First Coast News at 11. 70 years old and facing the possibility of spending the rest of her life in prison. Former Congresswoman Kareem Brown spent more than three decades of her life as a public servant. Now she's a convicted felon. Tonight she's at home awaiting sentencing. A 12 member jury found Brown guilty of 18 of 22 federal charges today, including fraud and corruption. But her attorney says the fight isn't over. And tonight we have team coverage for you of what's next for the former congresswoman, reaction from the community, and we're going back to where this all started. We begin with Stephen Dial, who is live tonight outside of the federal courthouse. Stephen? Heather, when Congresswoman Corrine Brown left the courthouse, she was silent, stone faced, not saying anything. She released a statement later in the day saying that she will fight to remain and maintain her reputation despite being found guilty. Tonight, she says she's innocent. Congresswoman, do you have anything to say to your supporters? Sure, Silent and stoic after being found guilty on 18 corruption and fraud charges. A sharp contrast from the conversation I had with Corrine Brown days before the trial started. On my tombstone, it will not say felon guilty. You're not guilty. Not guilty. This community hit hard by a verdict that many were watching very closely. Here in the north side area is where something started in this case at this restaurant where back in January of 2016 Brown was holding a political strategy session. 
where federal agents served her with a subpoena that started a case that would end with today's guilty verdict. It's a sad day. In a restaurant with roots dating back farther than Corrine Brown's long political career. She did a lot for the community. And she was well loved too. Several gathered at the Bono's barbecue on Norwood Avenue to watch the verdict come in. Gotta get it together. And welcome back to the Olympic Zone. Well, there is never a dull moment with a pair of outspoken and controversial retired Olympic figure skaters. So NBC dared to ask them to cover cultural events in Rio. And here are the end results. Here we go. They've been called America's It Couple. Our Jeannie Blaylock and Sports Director Chris Porter, they join us now live from Rio. And let's start with Jeannie. Hi, Jeannie. Hello, it is a big night for one of our hometown guys, Caleb Dressel, graduated Clay High, trained at Bulls. First Coast sports anchor Alyssa Lang, time now to take a look at your medal count. The United States still sitting in first place, but it shouldn't come as a surprise. It's been like that for the last two Olympic Games, starting with Beijing in 2008. The United States finished that Olympic Games with 36 gold medals, 38 silver and 36 bronze. Most locals here just aren't all that worried about Zika until you start talking about babies, and that's when they slow down and think a little bit harder. They realize the virus could actually influence their next generation here on the island. I met a woman, she's pregnant with Zika, and tells me she was like most other people, not all that worried about mosquitoes. If you listen, to the rhythm of Puerto Rico. You'll no doubt hear that perception is reality. This is a great gem. I'm not worried. I am not. That's a non-issue for me. But the rhythm stops when people like Jorge Ortiz and Yvette Molina now I have 30 wicks. come out of the water. It's our first baby. Baby Milan Arturo's due November 12th and right now is Zika free. It sometimes can go very undetected. It is time to go the globe and we are here in Holland near Amsterdam to teach about buddy check. And we're spreading the message about catching breast cancer early. People from all over the world come to check out these beautiful windmills. They uh, pump water in the lower canals to see how those famous wooden shoes are made. And oh my goodness, Holland is just beautiful. We just got off the plane a couple of hours ago and we're already meeting women who know about breast cancer, they know about checking themselves, but they're not really doing it. And today, right by these beautiful sites, I was able to meet people from all over the world. Buddy check team from Spain. Yeah, I live in uh, close to the Hague. Oh, I'm detecting the <laughs> Scottish accent, right? <laughs> That's correct. And where are you from? Glasgow. Glasgow. Oh, I, I can't say it the way you do, though. Glasgow. Glasgow. Oh, there you go. <laughs> and tell them about Buddy Check. Well, we're happy to kind of help you make sure that you know how to catch breast cancer early. So now we have brand new Buddy Check teams from all over the world, and they're going to remind each other to check every month. Have you ever done a self-exam? Yes, 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 yes. You have? Oh, great. Yes, do you do it every month? Like this mom-daughter yeah. team from yeah. Spain. No, every month, no. Okay, no, really, so, so really you got to invite your mom, okay? Get up, get out of your bed to do something a little different right now. Yeah, you know, the mission of First Coast News is to make Jacksonville a better place. And that means bringing you a perspective from people that we don't often hear from. In this case, we're talking about kids. Kids who live in a neighborhood known more for fear than hope. Sometimes I'm feeling like it ain't no way about it. Sometimes I'm looking at the edge and I'm so ready to jump, I am sinking. I can't find my way up over the hump. I 
I hear the homies from out east. I hear the homies in jail. The ones that's been denied parole and been denied bail that say we are the voiceless and you've been through this hell, but we see you out here representing us well. You find a new way to win every time that you feel you are me, so doggone that you got a story to tell. Say, go and show them that little black boys can have futures. Or get on the stage and change the image that they used to. Show them that we all not thugs, rappers, and hoofers. Tell our ghetto gospel, be our Martin Luther. Because we don't have a lot of leaders to speak for our generation. So you be the example that we are not our situation. My name is Bryant Hill and I'm 11 years old. I fear of death at, at the wrong time in life. One of my school friends had passed away uh, yesterday because like sometimes people people um do bad things and I don't want to be the, the victim or I don't want to die at the wrong time. My name is Tyler Russell and I'm 16 years old. And my biggest fear is the street. Well, like, in my school, there, I know there are gangs in my school. They need to get their life right, because it's not good, and be safe. Because I know some of their friends, they died from being in the gang, or they got killed or something. I don't want nothing to happen to them. Anything bad can happen, like anything. You never know what's going to come to you, all the bad things that's happening right now. I just don't want to let anyone important down in my life, like really down. My name is Jordan Bernard Matthews, and I am 11 years old. Well, at my age, fear is this society and people in this environment. See, people are all made different, differently. And sometimes people have a lot of anger built in them. So they take it out on other people. They break into other people's house and stuff like that. In this society, people are getting shot for no possible reason. I mean, it's just because of the choices that the other people make to kill that person or not. <laughs> My greatest hope? I think of hope and fear every day, but mostly hope. I, I hope that God and prayer will help me be successful in school and in life. I like to be in college or playing football for, for um, Florida State. I'm just a happy girl. Hope is church and my faith is in God. College, college. Just stay focused. Don't let nothing discourage you. My greatest hope is to go to Harvard where I would study pre-law, become a lawyer, have three kids, and be successful. When I get grown, it shows me hope to keep striving to get a degree. It becomes the thing that I want to be. So you keep spreading that love. Let your voice be loud. Be the man that I raised. Make your grandmama proud. Show this world that you are articulate. Leave them in wow. You should be making a congregation out of every crowd. She say, I'm watching you from the clouds, but I can't rest in peace until my rose has fully blossomed. So you're speaking for me. There's too many kids out there that's just like me, and I'm living to do what I was meant to do for the voice that they sweep under the rug. Speaking for you.
It's a, it's a unique place. Everybody knows everybody, and everybody gets along with everybody. Scuba is a nice little town, okay? If you've been on Main Street, it looks like that Matt Dillon may step out from behind a building uh, and have a shootout. Scuba's, Scuba's its own little special place. I've lived here 50, 53 years. Of... When I'm here, I'm just working. Uh, and if I'm not working, I'm probably not here. But I would imagine it's somewhere around 11 or 12,000 people in the entire county. Scuba's not a very big place, but I, for me, when I played here, I couldn't wait to get here because I came from a small place. DMCC ready to go in this contest, the Lions. I don't really know any other way to describe it, dude, except now, now, we're known for being national champions and it was on this football field here at First Coast High School that DeAndre Johnson burst onto the scene, making plays like this one, captivating fans and catching the eye of Division I college football coaches across the country. But it was this video that the world saw, surveillance video that would change the course of his life. I traveled to a place in the middle of nowhere in Mississippi where DeAndre Johnson is rebuilding his life and career. Scuba, Mississippi. Had you even heard of that before you got here? Never heard about it. I'm like, Scuba, Mississippi? <laughs> I wanna go to Mississippi. Scuba, Mississippi. Population 500. Home of East Mississippi Community College. When you arrived here, where were you uh, mentally, emotionally, physically? I was a wreck. <laughs> uh, I made a mistake. It's a choice that I did, and I have to uh, pay the price for it now. DeAndre Johnson is paying the price for punching Abby Husty in the face at a Tallahassee nightclub in the summer of 2015. Let's go back to the night in that Tallahassee bar. First and foremost, why were you there? Well, it was kind of like a team, uh, a team spot. What happened? I made a mistake. Uh, I should never done it. Uh, don't really, don't, don't really matter what she did or what provoked me. Nothing, nothing like that. It was just uh, I should never uh, raise my hand to her. After it transpired and you, and, and, and you had an opportunity to walk away from it, at what point did you say, oh my God, what have I done? I think the day after, you know, uh, started getting a lot of phone calls and uh, Coach Fisher and, and the whole staff. And then, uh, you know, all of a sudden I see, see myself on TV. I'm like, oh man, you know, and uh, it, just, it, it just got big, you know. I didn't think it was, it was gonna be that big. Former Florida State football quarterback DeAndre Johnson. One day I know my sports center. I'm on Good Morning America, the Breakfast Club, Winnie Williams show. I'm like, oh man, this 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 thing got crazy. I'm thinking I'm going I'm going to get a suspension, you know, for at least what a game or or a year. Originally, you know, Jimbo Fisher suspended DeAndre indefinitely. Then the video was released. Shortly after, Jimbo kicked DeAndre off the team. You know, I understand, you know, I understood, but uh, it was like my heart just dropped. His dream of playing for the Seminoles since he was six was over. Well, guys, when we first reached out to Abby Husty, she was reluctant to agree to our sit-down interview because she feared she'd have to endure more public backlash. But she says after much thought and prayer, she felt it was the perfect opportunity to set the record straight about what happened inside that nightclub more than a year ago. I still have a scar right here. Mm. Um, from where it cut my face. How difficult is it for you to look at these pictures? It's kind of weird because I, I feel like I've removed myself from it almost. Inside her parents' home outside of Orlando, Abby Husty looks at the photos taken after she was punched in the face at a Tallahassee nightclub in the summer of 2015. This was when you can see the full bruising in the other eye too. Here and then my lip was absolutely like purple underneath under here husty says she was waiting at the bar when all of a sudden she felt someone shove her so i turned around i was i, I said hey um what are you doing i was here first and then he grabbed my arm mm -hmm. so he grabbed my left wrist and that kind of just set off flags with me I husty says she freaked out and then he grabbed my other wrist and I didn't know what to do, so I put my knee up on his uh, abdomen to try and push him off of me because I didn't feel very safe. After I did that, he, sh he 
basically shoved my arms back toward me and I got one hand free and kind of swung at him like to get him away. And that's when he hit me in the face. Abby is referring to DeAndre Johnson as he because at the time she had no clue who DeAndre was. I remember just being like, did that just happen? Like, I'm pretty sure I even looked at my hand. I was like, oh my gosh, I just got hit in the face. Face bloody and confused, people who were inside the bar told her it's DeAndre Johnson from Florida State's football team. She immediately filed a police report. Husty says the backlash was overwhelming. Yeah, I definitely had a lot of people, um, a good amount who did go to Florida State or were Florida State alumni who would message me and be like, you deserved that. I can't believe you got him kicked off the team, like calling me names and kind of saying that I was at fault. A terrified child makes a heroic call. My dad is drunk and he's the only one driving. He's driving really fastly. The message for anyone who's had a few drinks and gotten behind the wheel. Plus, most of us treat dogs like family, but First Coast News finds hundreds of dogs are dying at Florida racetracks. And it's video that makes your jaw drop. The risky job where simple mistakes can be deadly. First Coast News starts now. You're about to hear a phone call that's hard to forget, but it is important to remember that phone call was made by a terrified nine year old girl. And that little girl called police because she was scared she was going to die. She told the 911 operator that she was in the car with her father who was driving drunk. And that decision to call 911 may have saved her life, her father's life, and the lives of people driving on the streets that night. First Coast News reporter Stephen Dial listened to that phone call and picks up the story from here. Stephen. Anthony, this is an emotional 911 call from a nine year old girl. We aren't saying her father's name or showing his face to protect that girl's identity, but we hope that her brave call to police sends a strong message to never drink and drive. I don't know what I'm saying. People saving me. A frantic 911 call from a nine year old girl. I know my dad is drunk and he's the only one driving, and I think I'm going to get into a mess. She and her little sister helpless and alone in the car with their father in Glen County. Your dad is drunk and he's the only one driving. Where yes, are you right is. now? Are, are, are you I, in the car with him? Yes, and he's driving really fastly. And I think I'm going to get into a wreck and kill myself. Frightened, she told the dispatcher she didn't know where they were. I don't know where I am right now. Daddy, stop the freaking car. Stop the car! Over somewhere. It's a very primal fear. Being in a small space that's filled with water horrifies some people. Claustrophobia? Deep dark place. It's a deep dark place. <laughs> Dr. Andrew Pitkin and his colleague Brett Hemphill dive Florida's vast network of underground caves, mapping and exploring spots that few have ever been to, and even fewer would care to go. Some divers would look at that and go, you guys are just crazy. To fight the current, divers use underwater scooters that allow them to swim for miles. Some caves run as deep as 400 feet, with passages so narrow, the divers can barely squeeze through. It might be like somebody who's, you know, free climbing El Capitan in Yosemite, as opposed to somebody who's just going for a hike you know, and looking at the nice scenery in terms of the logistics and the, the effort and the level of experience involved. Eagle's Nest in southwest Florida is often described as the Mount Everest of cave diving. It's very easy to get deep quick, which also adds to the potential, potential danger for this site. A placid pond on the surface, it plunges 200 feet before branching out into narrow and complicated tentacles. It has earned a reputation for lethality, a fact reflected in signs above the surface and below. There should be no misinterpretation of that. The signs say that no uncertain terms, the, the, they, will, they will not come out alive. Such was the case in October, says Hernando County Sheriff Al Nienheis. Two experienced divers went in, both failed to surface. Like many sports, very dangerous, and if you make one mistake, it can have very uh, tragic consequences. He got stuck in this restriction right here. When the bodies were found, only one diver was wearing his underwater breathing unit called a rebreather. We do know he got stuck. He got stuck so badly 
that at some point he decided it would be advantageous to remove all of his equipment and literally left it laying in the dirt, completely intact, completely functioning. The divers made it nearly two thirds of the way back, sharing a single breathing apparatus, but air and distance weren't the only challenges. When he decided to, to, to ditch his equipment, he became hopelessly buoyant. Literally had to make his way across the ceiling. They were the ninth and 10th divers known to have died at Eagle's Nest. And just four days after we visited, another death, the 11th. Tonight, multiple current and former firefighters have come forward concerned about their department. We've obtained pages of records and took those to the fire chief, asking him to explain a history of mechanical problems and test failures. <laughs> Consider the red lights a reminder. The fire is not spreading. Time is of the essence. Well, I expected them to put the fire out. That's what I expected. Not just the house, it pushed forward. But 33 years of the Mainer's life was in flame. Yeah, they got here, but then they didn't have what they needed to do what they needed to do which was water. Maynard's house is just nine tenths of a mile from Camden County's fire station 18. A report detailing the department's response shows engine 18 arriving in five minutes, but its partner truck, tanker 18, not arriving for nine. So then I thought they were going to save the front part of the house, but he said he ran out of water and he didn't have no water. Fire trucks coming, but they don't have no water in the tanker. So what is you coming for? Tanker trucks are often used in rural areas because there's no fire hydrant. It's pitch black, dark, smoke so thick, it's hot, there's fire everywhere. Keith Tippins worked to stop the fire from spreading. His helmet melted by the flames that ultimately destroyed the home. Ceiling started failing, cracking, uh, the trusses were, were failing. He resigned from the Camden department less than a month after the fire, citing concerns for his and resident safety. It's not unusual to have periods where you're waiting on water because we don't have fire hydrants. We Camden Fire Chief Mark Cruz says he investigated and supports how the department responded. Initially, the two people at that fire station, there's two people and two apparatuses. So initially, both people get on the fire engine because of the small fire, they can knock it down with the water they come on the truck with, then that's what they do. So actually, Tanker 18 that responded to that fire, the nearest one, was actually picked up by another crew on their way to the fire. But this fire isn't the only one that's raised concern for former Camden firefighters. In 2015, a fire destroyed one of the most famous homes in South Georgia, the Cisco House. Um, but the trucks that we have have so many mechanical problems, we couldn't supply enough water to battle that fire. So we'll call this guy Al one of the first on scene of the two alarm fire. Flames were not initially on the first floor of the three story home. I wholeheartedly believe it could have been stopped and knocked down, but just due to a lack of, and just the training itself, the lack of manpower that we had, that house went from being something that could have been saved to burning completely to the ground. There was tankers all over the place, so I, not, I would not agree with that statement at all. We interviewed eight current and former Camden firefighters for this story. If I don't feel safe, I know the citizens aren't safe. With at least 60 years of experience with the department, all concerned mismanagement and failing equipment will prevent them from keeping the community safe. Yeah, absolutely, I feel, feel unsafe doing my job. Records obtained by First Coast News show more than 500 work orders for fire engines, tankers, and ambulances in 2015 and 2016. Things like brakes not working properly, gauges resetting on a fire engine causing it to shut down, and water level indicators not reflecting how much is in the tank. Almost half of the work orders took at least three months to fix. Some took up to a year. Cruz says the department's since hired its own mechanic to catch up on repairs. Because what they see is a big red truck going down the road with lights. They have no clue what we're doing. They have no clue where we're going. Um, they have no clue that, that truck may not make it there. Another current firefighter we'll call Bob says speaking out would cost him his job. He pointed us to records showing Camden fire engines multiple times failed something called a pump test. The critical test makes sure enough waters pushed through a hose to reach the fire. The records show 40% of the county's equipment failed in 2015 and 60% failed in 2016. 
a truck a year old that's rated at 1250 needs to pump 1250 and they're not doing it and he allows them to stay in service. The fire chief says that's because inspectors use a national rating form that requires 1,250 gallons per minute. But Georgia law requires less, only 750 gallons. Again, it comes down to what can you afford. Um, right now, those trucks are in service and they meet Georgia law, so we're in compliance. At the Mainer's house, the most recent pump test records are blank for engine 18, the first engine to show up. Engine 17, the next one on the scene, failed the national pump test just weeks before the fire. I hadn't got the fire out my eyes yet. An anonymous letter showed up in the Mainer's mailbox. A firefighter on scene that day wrote Tanker 18, the first on scene, wouldn't build air pressure and the problem was reported several weeks ago. To put something like that in writing and then put it in the mailbox. It had to be something going on and it hadn't just started. We're doing what we can with the funding that we're giving and uh, the funding is there. We're doing everything we can, but you can't just go in and replace everything at once. Anthony, firefighters originally told me a mechanical issue was to blame, but Camden Fire Chief Mark Cruz gave me a very different explanation in my interview with him last week. It matters because the fire and the department's response revealed broader concerns about how the department's being managed. Pump tests like this one make sure enough water's getting through the hose and to a house fire. But Chief Mark Cruz told us maintenance issues were not to blame at the Mainer's house. He said tanker 18, less than a mile from the house, was four minutes late because another crew came to pick it up. Initially, the two people at that fire station, there's two people and two apparatuses. So initially, both people get on the fire engine because of the small fire, they can knock it down with the water they come on the truck with, then that's what they do. So actually, Tanker 18 that responded to that fire, the nearest one, was actually picked up by another crew on their way to the fire and brought to the fire. So that's why you have that time delay. We've learned that's not true. A report detailing the department's response shows both Engine 18 and Tanker 18 were dispatched at the same time. Engine 18 arrives in five minutes, but Tanker 18 arrives in nine, a four minute difference. We now know mechanical issues caused the delay. In a statement, Fire Chief Cruz says, I inadvertently provided incorrect information on the record. This misstatement was based on my recollection of the event and a previous department policy. He says Tanker 18 was four minutes delayed to the scene of the Highway 259 fire, not because it was waiting for personnel, but because the truck needed to build the appropriate air pressure in its brake system. After our reporting, the department's begun retesting all of their engine pumps. 60% previously failed against a national standard, but all complied with the less demanding Georgia law, which allowed them to stay on the street. Two trucks were tested today, and both passed the higher rated national standard. The testing did get cut short today because of weather, but the department says they'll continue testing tomorrow. The two trucks they tested today did pass that higher national standard. But after our reporting, the Camden County Administrator says he is going to begin a full top to bottom review of the fire department. Foyer, former Fayette County Administrator and Fire Chief will conduct that review. The audit will examine all equipment, personnel and concerns of the department. Uh, the county administrator says the review will, quote, uncover any issues that need attention, and he says, quote, instill confidence in the public. On your side, I'm Clark Foyger, First Coast News. We know that the manatee is alive. We don't know if it's a boy or a girl, but tell us what's going on behind you right now. Jeannie, we have not heard just yet whether it is a boy or a girl, but we just got an update from Cruz. They tell us the manatee is still alive, yet it is slightly injured. As you can see, crews are still working as hard as they can to get this manatee removed from the storm drain here on Da Vinci Avenue in the Ortega neighborhood. Now, they have made a lot of process in the last 10 minutes. They were just about to lift the top of that storm pipe up with chains, but they stopped uh, midway and they're going back in now still digging around it. Now, as you can see, we have several crews out here, lots of people on the corner, lots of spectators here looking, watching this. A lot of people tell me they have not seen anything quite like this before. <laughs> Cheers and applause all around, guys. Yeah, I just, I, 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 I,
<laughs> One lady just said that's not a very big manatee. She's seen bigger ones, but people are excited that it's out. Curtis, what are you doing? I'm trying to find the on switch. How do you get the, hey, come on, buddy. Get moving, get moving. Show's coming up. First Coast Living live at the fair. Get ready for a fair edition of First Coast Living. It all starts right now. I found it. Welcome back to First Coast Living, folks. We're out here on the floor, home and patio show. Welcome to a very special edition of First Coast Living. We are live at the Players' Championship in Ponte Vedra Beach, TPC Sawgrass. Please welcome iconic television star Dawn Wells to the show. She hey. is an antique, and she's right oh, here. Oh, stop. <laughs> so the question is, can you break down the shot? I mean, every time you come on, you do this, and you're gracious enough to talk about <laughs> the shot. Welcome back, folks. Have you got a chance to check out the Jacksonville Armada? Here we go. Alerts, Henny, Angie, and Bonnie all join the panel today. And Bonnie is turned up today. Bonnie yes. is turned. Oh, that's you. Oh, that's you the shot best. Him. I shot him. Ooh. Yeah, I just shoot people. Oh, my um, God. oh it is so good to be back. So and excited. thank you for having me. World crown. Yes. 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 Oh, my yes. God. I'm sorry. Black people have a hair yeah. moment. Black people we have a hair moment. moment. <laughs> 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 we're just going to sit back and let Henny drag this bus. What about this? What's in your hand here? I know. You have something in Yes, play that thing, baby. Hindsight 2020, I think I would have been a much better mom had I just enjoyed my child oh, and not put yeah. all this pressure on myself to yeah. breastfeed. That's what I have to say about this. <laughs> yes. oh. This is some very exciting news for Jacksonville University. Today, the university announced that it is teaming up with the popular shark tracking research group, O search. So here are a few things that we already know about sharks. They average around 13 feet long. They weigh around 1300 pounds. And did you know that sharks, they don't have any bones. They are made up of a tough, flexible cartilage similar to the human ear and nose. And there are more than 350 species of sharks. The smallest sharks, they're only six inches long. Now local researchers are hoping to learn a lot more. And tonight, First Coast News' Monica Garcia takes a look at what this means for the university and how it will put Jacksonville on the world stage. This evening, we are raising money for a great cause. You can call, uh, you can text, or even go to our website, firstcoastnews.com, to donate. This is our project to help Canines for Warriors, a nonprofit here on the First Coast. They custom train service dogs to help veterans with PTSD. So far, more than 260 veterans have graduated from this program. And get this, the success rate, 99%, helping veterans avoid suicide after they get their service dog. So we are in the Canines Warriors, the Operation Orion phone bank right now. The number to call is 632-1200. They're hard at work. Actually, it's great. A friend of ours, a friend of Good Morning Jacksonville, William Taylor, just making his donation. And what he donated, thank you, William, getting a fist pump, right? That total was great on Friday, but look at this. Another 30,000 came in over the weekend. So tonight, our new total is $453,479 donated. That is just, it's just amazing. This is enough to build a training facility for Warriors and their service dogs and open it next year in Nocatee. In Jacksonville. And good morning to you, Lieutenant Keith and Nelson live with you from the baseball grounds of Jacksonville. What a huge day it is. The home opener for the new Jacksonville Jumbo Shrimp doing their thing tonight. We couldn't leave Katie Jeffries and oh. Mike Prangley in the studio. They're here with us as well, getting us ready for our day. Weather and traffic together. Good morning, guys. How we doing? We are so great. We're so excited to be here. <laughs> there is no day as great as opening day of baseball, especially when you have a field like this. Beautiful. Where I call one of the country's best fields, and you see that why. logo. Lush green grass, a forecast that doesn't get better. In fact, I'm giving it a five jumbo shrimp out of five, Katie, right. with a high five. Let's walk <laughs> on over here and take a look at the latest. Okay, so we start with no school and work. We gotta get there safely, so we got Katie's commuters. And what we're watching is this. There's just a few areas of patchy fog. So notice temperature-wise, low to mid-50s and Lynn, long I Yeah, the green grass is our green screen this morning, so that's pretty cool. Let's take a look out here at our traffic maps. Interstates look pretty good, but still wanna talk about what's going on in Baker County because State Road 2 still closed because of the wildfire in the area. It's closed from Ed Grade Road down to